Hello and welcome to Cheshire Audio. Now today I'm going to be talking about Exposure 5010 preamp and Exposure 5010 monoblocks, which I've been intending to review for a while, um, but basically it's really heavy and stupid reason, but I needed to put them from a sh low shelf onto a high shelf and I kept looking at it and thinking, oh, not today. Oh, my back's hurting a bit. Oh, so yeah, it's just kind of the bane of the sort of hi-fi shop worker. Um, bad back from carrying the nice barracks and Krell 80s and all sorts of mad stuff over the years. It's sort of um, left its mark really. So yeah, um, so yeah, moving it onto the top shelf. I've done it now. And one of the reasons I've done it is that there was, this morning I had the chat from Exposure in and I promised him I was going to do it today because I'd said I'll, I'll, I've got to review the 5010. Um, so I promised I was going to do it today. Also, Exposure are having a price rise. Um, and this is a bit short notice, but if you want to buy an Exposure product, and you want to ring me up and give me a deposit for something because there's quite a long waiting list and everything. The prices are going up on the 1st of April, which we're on the 22nd now. Um, so you've got a, pretty much a week. Actually, by the time I've edited this and posted, we might be a bit closer to the time. Um, hopefully do it within the next couple of days. So hopefully by the 20th, I'll probably post this by about the 24th, I think. So yeah, if you want to just ring up and give me pay, pay a deposit. I mean, things like 3510s are taking actually months at the moment to come. 2510s aren't so bad, they're coming through in a few weeks. Uh, the bigger stuff, not so sure. There's, and also if you want to get your name on one of the new CD players, there's this 3510 CD player, which is imminent, actually, that's imminent. If you want one of those, give me a call, get your name on one, but just a little deposit, something like that, just to, just to do it. Anyway, 5010, which is over there. Um, history of exposure, you see, I'm a bit flaky on this. I don't know a huge amount about exposure. And I think probably that's the case countrywide because it's not like Name Audio where they were very much to the fore. They were always a really good alternative to Name, really good alternative, and it was almost the, the, sort of the thinking man's name, really. But I think Name won over in the end, popularity-wise, because of this link up with Lynn. There was always the, the Lynn name combinations, and you didn't think about anything else. That was that was where everybody went with it, really. If they were going in the sort of what they called at the time the flat Earth route. But exposure were always kind of, a, in some ways, a better alternative. Not always, but certain models were sort of, it was personal preference. But generally, I always sort of preferred exposure. And if I'm honest, I was thinking about this the other day, because I think, I don't know if everybody, everybody does this, but if you, sometimes I'll sit down and think about really good systems that you could put together and, and you know, this turntable with this amplifier, these pair of speakers. And quite often, there'll be a, a top end exposure pre power in there. Um, I mean, sort of the. If I was being a little bit less less sort of practical about it, I'd probably be thinking about an audio research preamp from the eighties and an audio, um, say, a Krell KRS eighty um, power amp from the eighties. But obviously, those things are getting on a bit now. They were always expensive and expensive to run. In modern day equipment, it's got to be the big exposure, really. I mean, it's it's still sensible ish money, um, but it gives you that kind of current and all that sort of stuff that you got from the big stuff from years ago. Anyway, I'm going off on a bit of a, I'm wandering off here. What I'm going to do though, I want to, I want to sort of talk through the, sort of the, the, the looks and the features and the, probably touch on price even a little bit. I'm going to do something new on this one. I'm actually going to take the lid off because I've been, <laughs> people have been saying, why don't you show inside? And it's because, well, I'm going to have to get a screwdriver out and all that sort of thing. But yeah, I've, I've actually loosened one of the lids on one of the power ups just to show, partly because it's magnificent really is inside. It's just a, a, th a thing to behold inside. So anyway, um, yeah, history, I've, got talk, I've got to talk about the history of exposure, wasn't it? I've completely gone off on one. Started by John Farlow. I think he was the original guy. Um, there was a bit of a link up with Martin's Hi-Fi, I think. But John Farlow had started off in sort of the sort of studio, well not studio side, more sort of stage stuff. I think he, he had some involvement with Pink Floyd, actually, but making the, the rigs for stage use. Um, and ended up starting exposure. Probably, I think I've, I've read somewhere that it was like a, a, a an, easy, an easier life was you know, creating his own amplifiers or whatever. But it was exposure electronics have always been very much in the sort of a bit like name really whopping big transformer, very simple circuits, very good quality componentry, um, or at least very well matched componentry. Not necessarily expensive, but chosen for the job it was intended and whatever. Um, but very, 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 very simple. 
Uh, nothing superfluous, a bit like the Riga thing and whatever, but nothing superfluous, nothing extra in there. Um, but like I said, whopping big transformer, loads of current. Not necessarily a powerful amplifier, but loads of drive current, so they would drive speakers very, very well. Um, I mean, one thing about the 5010 is when we actually get over there and start talking about it and looking at it, whatever. Um, that is actually quite a powerful amplifier. It's a couple of hundred watts a channel into 8 ohms, which is, by today's standards, in high-end, well, in audiophile type products, that is quite high. Normally, in amplifiers that are sort of up there in the, the wattage per channel, um, you'll find that they'll not be that impressive into low, uh, different impedances, um, which generally means it, what, what that generally means is if you, you're driving a pair of speakers, as long as the speakers are fairly stable, it'll be okay, but if the speaker impedance goes all over the place, and you know, if a big bass note comes along and the impedance drops, they, they start to, they'll sound shrill and whatever, and you have to turn them up to get them to sound any good. The exposure actually is almost what you would call the perfect amplifier in that respect. It virtually doubles up into four ohms. It's nearly 400 watts into, into four ohms, which is what the perfect amplifier should do. I mean, some of the big crowls I was talking about before would actually double up all the way down to one ohm. I don't think the exposure would do that, but then again, with modern speakers, it's not as there's not really anything out there that's cr crazy, crazy impedance-wise. Um, I think old so Apache, Apache, I can't even say Apache Scintillas, I believe, were about half an ohm, and you needed some massive big amplifier the size of a coffee table to drive them. There's nothing like that around now, I don't think, particularly. Not, or not certainly not in the UK. We don't really get stuff like that. Um, most things are sort of four, eight ohm, sort of ish, and fairly stable. So. 200 into, 200 into 8 and nearly 400 into 4, it covers everything you would ever need, really. Um, but anyway, what I'm going to do, before I start getting bogged down in all this and people start shouting in comments, as they, as they seem to enjoy doing sometimes, some people anyway, um, let's have a look at them. Uh, they're on the table over there. My back is still, yeah, I think the power is a 14 kilos each. Something like that. And the preamp's not that far behind, actually. The pre preamp's quite heavy. Uh, let's have a look and we'll... Um, Look at the features and or lack of. <laughs> I'll talk a bit more. Um, just have a drink and let's let's move the camera. Okay, so front panels. We've got on the left hand side. We've got the fifty ten preamp. Right hand side, the two fifty ten monoblocks. Um, available silver and black, as you can see. Um, I tend to prefer the black, and there's a reason for it actually. Uh, generally, I'd go with silver on products, but I think exposure. I think it's a his historically they were always black, really. Uh, and if you look closely, interesting, I don't know any other manufacturer that does this. Silver, the silver finish one has got a black script and blue LED. And the black finish has got the original gold script, a different font nowadays, obviously. Um, but yeah, red LED and obviously red LED on the other one as well. Nice big thump from the real you switching on. So, if you're one of these people who hates blue LEDs, and there, is, there seems to be a lot of a lot of hate out there for blue LEDs, I don't know why. Um, you've got the black option, so there you go. Um, Features-wise, like I say, there's not an awful lot going on the front panel. I mean, the the preamp weirdly is is indistinguishable visually from the the, um, the 2510 integrated. I mean, I, you could criticise them for that, just using the same box, but actually, costing-wise, why not? If you've got a box that does the job. And it's a good looking amp, why not? Why not have you know the same case work? So yeah, I don't, I don't mind that. I think that's quite a good thing really. Um, very simple, plain looking thing. Very, the quality of it just, it just feels really good quality. Um, the actual smoothness of the volume control and the really nice to use. Probably a little bit too easy actually. It's occasionally, if you, occasionally when I go to the volume on this, I'll knock, knock the input slightly and it's, it's almost not got enough of a click on it really. But. That's possibly the only criticism of the whole thing, really, um, that it's the, the control is a little bit too free. Um, but anyway, what I'm going to do um, is have a look at the back panel. We'll talk about inputs and all the things. I'll look at the back panels first, and then we'll we'll open up and have a and have a look inside one of the power amps. Let's have a look at the preamp first, and quite a lot of socketry going on. Left hand side, we've got um, auxiliary one, which is also labelled phono, because you can actually fit a, a phono card input to this so which so then it would become your record player input and there's your little earth earth screw um, then we've got another one two three four five line inputs on here so plug it I mean they're actually labeled up tuner CD auxiliary to whatever but you can plug anything line level into that um, which covers pretty much anything 
anything, well, anything, anything analog anyway. Um, we've also got record, record out, which is sort of grouped with the tape, but the record out is quite useful if you've got a headphone amplifier or use a few Stax headphones which need a full line output and the, and the, the volume control is actually on the, on the headphone box. Uh, but we've also got two variable outs, so two, two sets of pre-out, which means you could actually have four 5010 monoblocks, and now that that is <laughs> that's quite a thought, actually. Blimey. Um, yeah, you could have four 5010s, so you could have a, a pair of two-way speakers with um, a 5010 monoblock per drive unit. I mean, that would be, that'd be something else. Um, we've also got, and this is quite unusual on, on UK kit, actually, uh, we've got two balanced XLR outputs. Um, I I'm going to be quite controversial. I don't always like the XLR option. Um, there's an awful lot of amplifiers out there. I've never tried it on this, actually. I've never tried it on the, on the exposure. Quite a lot of things I've tried have had XLR. It's been smoother, better defined, but blander. It's, it's like the, the, the actual phone output has got a bit more life about it. I know, the the I know theory says otherwise, um, but that's what I found. I don't know. I'm a bit undecided about that. I always try it to see, but generally I tend to prefer the, prefer the phone. Um, I mean, really, this has come from the studio side. and The intention is for uh, to be used with lo long runs of cables. Um, that's the, the whole theory of balance, is it use it. it's, it's suitable for long runs and you don't get any, any drop-off. But, yeah, I don't know. Um, it's not something I know, I must admit, it's not something I know an awful lot about. Um, the inner workings of balance and all this thing and why it would be good and why it wouldn't. But all I can do is listen and generally, phone knows. I think the, the, one, the one thing I did listen to that was a big difference and much, much better on, on balanced was uh, Prime Air. I seem to remember their, their equipment always was way better on, on balanced. But anyway, that's going off on a, yeah, I'm sure people have their own opinions on that. Don't judge me just because I've got an opinion. Yeah, it's one of those things you always have to try. Always try the alternative and see. Uh, moving on to the power amp, we've got not a lot, actually. Um, single input there, and your XLR input. Uh, we've actually got two outputs on the speaker side, but the basically bridge across, it's the same thing. It's not two different amplifiers in there driving two different channels or anything like that. It's a, it's a single mono amplifier, but with two outputs, so you can buy wire if you want to. Um, just makes it a bit more straightforward. Standard IEC socket, which also I forgot to mention, like the IEC socket on the back of the preamp as well. So you can upgrade the cables if you want to. Um, yeah, let's have a let's have a look inside the power amp because that'll be interesting. So there you go. This is a, a 5010 with the lid off um, for all the people who have requested it. First thing you notice is the massive transformer. I mean, that is a crazily big transformer. Um, takes up pretty much half of the internal <laughs> space in the amp, and it's probably one of the main reasons they weigh so much. Um, I'd say that's about the same size as a transformer you'd probably see in something like a name NAT 500, which is their top power amp, um, or second to top power amp. Don't forget though, that's driving two channels. This is driving one, so there's two of these. So yeah, it's um, a fairly, fairly substantial thing. Um, big heat sink down the middle, um, two fairly major capacitors as well actually. It's, Tended to see things like that on some of the big American power amps, um, banks of massive capacitors, massive transformer, um, and this is kind of almost following that, following that sort of way of thinking really. Uh, next to the heat sink, you can see a bank of eight different output transistors. Um, below the board here, there's another board underneath. Can't actually see what's going on there, but yeah, another board underneath. So it's, it's not not massively complicated. It's just you know, just a fairly straightforward circuit, really. Just like I say, massive transformers, some good output transistors, big caps. There you go. Um, hopefully, that's um, pacified the people who've been asking, really, because I've, I've been meaning to do this for a while and just never quite, never quite get on with it. Never quite get to the point of getting a screwdriver out and taking taking the lid off. But anyway, there you go. Let's turn the camera around. So, exposure pre-power. What did I think of it? Um, I think it's wonderful, actually. I've always, I must admit, I've always liked. The big exposures. I think they've, they've, they've got something special about them. Um, and I know it's a lot to do with the big transformer and the, the, the attention to detail inside. But what's quite interesting is I think I'd say uh, the 5010s kind of up there with some of the high-end stuff. I mean, it's got that, that effortless ability to drive speakers and create this big 3D soundstage. 
that you only tend to get at the, the sort of top end of, of amplification. Um, but it's not in that sort of price category. I mean, it's still an expensive amp, but we're still looking at, I've got to say, eight to 9,000 um, for, the, for the three boxes. Um, it's about, at the moment, it's about eight, I can't think about eight, two at the moment, but it's going to be about eight, six, eight, seven, I think, when the price has gone up. Um, a lot of its competition is three times that. I mean, there's an awful lot of amplifiers now, sort of 30, 40, 50,000 plus pounds. Um, but a lot of them, I feel as though, are dressed up quite a bit to look like they're worth that sort of money because a lot of the manufacturers don't have the confidence in their own product, I would have said. That's probably a bit unfair. But if you, you should have confidence in your product. You should be able to just stick it in a, bit, uh, in a, a standard, standard black box like people have been making for years and just have the confidence in, in its ability to make beautiful music. You shouldn't have to make it look... You know, it shouldn't, have, it shouldn't need backlit perspex panels and turned titanium and curved heat sinks with the name written in it and all this sort of thing. And I know there's a market for that, I know people love stuff like that, but if you want to produce something wonderful musically, you don't need all that. You just need an exposure 5010. That's what you need. Um, I'm, really, I'm probably upsetting loads of people now. I actually love all the really fancy sort of high-end stuff. I love it. I think, it's, I think it's amazing. I really like it. But I think it does add to the cost. Because things are built in such small numbers, if you start creating fancy, fancy casework, um, you're adding thousands to the cost because it's, you know, it, it would probably cost a thousand, two thousand, three thousand pounds to create a fancy casework. You've almost got to add it, you've almost got to multiply it by 10 by the time it gets to the consumer. So, exposure where they're just, like I say, they're just the folded metal and the aluminum front panel, it's bare essentials, but it means that you get a lot of value out of it, a lot of value. Um, but like I say, it's got the ability of some of these higher end amps, it does that, it has that. Ability to create crescendo without you sort of wincing. Uh, it's a bit like the first time I listened to full orchestra at Albert Hall, I think it was. Never been that into classical particularly, but what took me by surprise was when the orchestra just went from, the, say, a really quiet passage and suddenly came, suddenly exploded into a crescendo, it didn't make you wince. It didn't make you sort of, you know, um, there was no reaction there because it was clean and clear and there was texture in it and it was beautiful. Uh, and the exposure manages to do that, I mean, it just manages to recreate it. it. It doesn't make you sort of uh, wince like that. Um, I mean, it has been said, a good sign of a good hi-fi system is one that you can talk over when it's playing quite loud. And it's true. If you ever hear a really good high-end setup, um, the noise doesn't dominate the room. It's there and it's impressive and it's dynamic. But it doesn't dominate. It doesn't sort of take over. You know, you can, you can talk over it. You can hear a conversation because uh, your voice is a separate entity to the music that's coming from the speakers. It's a very strange phenomenon, actually. Um, but yeah, exposure's up there. It does it. Um, it's really good in that respect. Probably needs a decent source. I mean, it's it, something of that sort of quality. You're not going to get away with budget sources. You need something pretty good on it, um, and it will pay dividends. Really, if you get the better the sources, the better. you a resort you'll get. Speaker-wise, it'll drive. It seems to drive anything. Um, I think I've said before. I actually, run it with a pair of little little mini mouse, and it's you know little mini mouse like that. Fantastic. <laughs> Just, I've had it with the, in here. I've had it with QDOS, which aren't that difficult to drive. I've had it with uh, some of the big dialies downstairs, which are slightly trickier. Um, oh, what else did I use it with? I don't, I've had a few things on up here up through the week. It's been uh, quite interesting, really. Um, but anyway, I'm going to leave it there. Um, yeah, I've quite enjoyed doing this one, actually. I think I might do a bit more sort of um, casework off jobs. Just um, so I'll see what see what the result of that one is. See if, if, you, if you've got any views on that, um, email me. Don't write in comments because I don't, I don't read comments because, because of that 1% of people who just like to shout at people. Um, yeah, so leave it there. Um, thanks for uh, watching. Thanks for subscribing if you have subscribed. Don't forget to give, give a like and a subscribe if you haven't. Um, these mugs are available if you want to buy one, buy one of these mugs, by the way. Um, actually, they're not on the website at the moment. Email me if you want a mug. Um, I actually lose money on every one, but uh, £10, I lose money on every one of them. But if you want a mug, let me know. Um, yeah, OK, thanks for watching. I'll see you in a future video.